Um, I, I was asked uh, by the publisher Harry Abrams back in the late 1990s if I was interested in doing a book with Jan Artus Bertrand, a name that I didn't know, quite honestly. Uh, but it turns out that he is the premier aerial photographer in the world. And the, fir the first time I went up with Jan in a helicopter, I assumed, well, he's an aerial photographer who rolled down the window. No, <laughs> he removes the side. And I'll be, uh, he has me sitting in the front, next, it's a four-seat helicopter, four -seated helicopter, and I sit next to the pilot and he, in the old days when he used film, would have an assistant back with him and he would bark orders to the assistant about what kind of film he wanted in the camera for that particular shot. He's now using a digital camera so his life is that much simpler. Uh, and he sits back there uh, with simply a, a waist belt around him and he will take one foot and put it outside the helicopter on the running board <laughs> and he'll say to the pilot, will you, will you tip the, the, the helicopter a little, a, 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 a little more, a, a little, a, oh, oh, that's, that's fine. He has lenses that are this long and they're, they're so, they're, they, they, I don't know how much they weigh, but they weigh a ton. They're, they have handles on them. And this man just hangs out of the helicopter and shoots. <laughs> and he has eyes like an eagle, which I'll, I'll show you one demonstration of the way he sees things. And he's, he's, a, he's a Frenchman. I, I don't know how old he is. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he, he was born just after World War II ended, so he might be 65. And he's built like a middle linebacker. He has shoulders on him like this. He has hands like a forward on the NBA. Uh, and he's as strong as an ox. And fearless. Uh, he, he calls me uh, Taranak the Maniac. Because I get, I get the, I'm not perfunctory in things I do. I become so punctilious that I wear myself out and I, I came to understand that in French the word maniac doesn't simply mean somebody who should be incarcerated. Uh, it also means somebody who takes great pain in doing fine work. So he was praising me when he called me Tarnak the Maniac. I, th I thought he was being rude, but he wasn't. Uh, uh, this is this is the cover of, of of New York from the air, and you can see that Jan gets top billing. <laughs> I'm down here and flew <laughs> tight. Uh, I, I uh, I'm perfectly happy to play second fiddle. I'm perfectly happy to be in the orchestra with Jan. Believe me, uh, and it's, it seems appropriate that a, the Statue of Liberty is on the cover of the book because it was, after all, a gift from the people of France. And I feel that Jan, uh, w w without getting mawkish about it, is a gift from, to the world of the, from the people of France. He really is a remarkable man. And this, this is the full view. Um, I almost wish that they had wrapped the book in this full view rather than cropping it. And it's one of the few manifestations of a photograph being cropped that Jan took. Uh, he, he, I mean, you know, here he is up there, two, three thousand feet up in the air, and he frames the photographs perfectly. And the photographs that he does not frame perfectly, he doesn't want exhibited. Now, I'm going to show you some outtakes. I sort of have his blessing. Um, but you'll understand why they're outtakes, uh, because his perspective is one of perfection. I mean, it's, I, I could just as easily say, Jan the Maniac, as he calls me, Taranak the Maniac. Um, but here's an, here's an example. Can everybody see? Can you, you want me to move just a tad over? Um, here's an example of uh, a photograph that did not make the cut. This is Union Square, uh, and if I were, you know, when I look at this photograph, I think, oh, you know, look at these new 
traffic markings here. I think about the foot of the, the transit kiosks here by Lee Harris Pomeroy. There are two of them, there's the other. I think of the statue of George Washington by Henry Kirk Brown, which used to be here, but it turned out to be a traffic hazard there, both to uh, machines and itself. So they moved it into the park for safety. I see uh, the flea market here, which uh, was started by the father of today's parks, parks commissioner. Uh, but Jan wasn't looking at any of this stuff. That's what he was looking at. Did you see it in that photograph? No? Right there. Now, when I say that Jan has an eye like an eagle, you believe me, right? Now, granted, he might be looking at this through a telephoto lens also, but still, to spot that is, is unbelievable. And it, it's one of those wonderful playgrounds uh, where there, there are no uh, adults necessary for supervision. The kids just figure out what they're going to do, and they do it, and they have a walloping good time doing it. Now, my wife likes to say, and uh, Carol gave you an intimation of what my wife might say, that I know every building in Manhattan. It's only a slight exaggeration, and I'm going to set out to prove uh, what an exaggeration it is. When I looked at this photograph, and it did not make the cut because I refused to allow this to go in the book because I couldn't identify the building. <laughs> I was convinced that it was down at Bryant Park. No, not Bryant Park, Greeley Square, sorry. It, and I thought this was the Greeley Square building on the northwest corner of 32nd and 6th Avenue. Went up in about 1930. And this new glass walled building I thought was the new apartment house by Condillis, who was probably the most prolific contemporary residential architect. I went, I, there was a tremendous deadline that I was writing under. I wrote the caption for it saying, this is the Greeley Square building, until I went and hopped on the number one downtown local. <coughs> It ain't the Greeley really Square building. Now, one, one of the problems is not having any hints on the periphery to, to give you a lead as to what you're looking at. If I had seen this building, I might have thought, I know where that is. This is 515 Madison. This was designed by J.E.R. Carpenter, the same guy who did the uh, Lincoln Building on 42nd. This is the this is Park Avenue Plaza, which was a bulky, huge building designed by uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And the reason for its bulk and it's a mid-block building, contrary to all theory, theory on zoning. Uh, is air rights. Uh, you know, when the Landmarks Preservation was commissioned, uh, when the Landmarks Preservation Commission was created, it was understood that it was, uh, uh, that the government couldn't appropriate property. And if you have a, I don't know, a three-story building, you have an envelope of space above you, an envelope of air, upon which you could normally build. and get money from. Well, if it's a designated landmark, you can't do that. So they've set up a deal whereby you could transfer the air rights from your property to a propinquitous site. And that's precisely what they did here. Down here, totally out of sight, on Park Avenue is the racket and tennis club. They sold their air rights and up went this building. So this place is at where? This is 53rd Street running along here. I know this building well because there's a subway, subway entrance to the IND in it. And this is 501 Madison Avenue, which was designed by Robert Cohn, who designed the, the Ethical Culture on 64th and Central Park West. And how many of you recognize this building? I showed this slide to a man who works in this building, the neighboring <laughs> building. He didn't recognize it. This building was a rather famous building in its time. 
you know Black Rock on 6th Avenue and 53rd, right? Well, this is the predecessor. This is the former headquarters for CBS. I looked at this photograph and I thought, oh boy, what is this mess? And I was really stumped, but I looked at these buildings up here and I thought, well, you know, those are red brick Greek revival buildings complete with eyebrow windows and there's no shadow on them. And I know that Jan had shot this in the winter. And if there were buildings across the street, there'd be shadows on those little buildings, right? Well, there are no buildings across the street because those buildings are looking out over Washington Square. And those buildings are called The Row. Uh, they're so famous, they're simply called The Row. They're the best stand of Greek revival red brick buildings in the city. So deductively, I said, well, this is NYU. And right here, it says Ash Pla. Now, there's a bit of irony to that, isn't it? Do you, do you know what this built? This is the original site of NYU. This is where the collegiate Gothic building was put up and when, I don't know when it was, 1848, 1850, so. And by the turn of the 20th century, NYU followed City College and Columbia further north. Columbia went to 116th, NYU uh, City College to 137th, and NYU went to the Bronx. And they tore down their collegiate Gothic building and put up this building, which was given the unfortunate name, if you remember, November 22nd in Dallas, the Book Depository. And there was a rump end of NYU in this building. The business school was here in the law school. Next door to it was a building with the name the Ash Building. It wasn't spelled the same. It was spelled A-S-C-H-E. And what do you think happened in the Ash Building a hundred years ago? Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, precisely. And the Ash Building is now the blandly named Brown Building. And it's the headquarters for science at NYU, which explains all of these uh, pipes, etc., venting all the stuff out. And here you can see that this does not just say Ash Place. It says 32 Wash Place, and I suppose it's there to aid, uh, you know, if somebody's up in a helicopter and wants to know, you know, where they are, <laughs> this will do it. <laughs> now this building stumped me. I looked at it and I said, well, it's clearly a post-1916 zoning law building because of all the setbacks, and I thought of the trim on it. You know, it's probably terracotta trim. So I said, you know, that building has to be in the, in the garment district. And I thought of this building, which is designed by the Brothers Blum down at 322 8th Avenue, 26th Street, I guess it is. And I thought of the similarity between the two buildings, so I was convinced that the, uh, that this building was designed by George and Edward Blum, both of, whom, both of whom had graduated from Le Col de Beaux-Arts in Paris. I asked a few friends if they could identify it. Peter Salwin, who wrote a pretty good book called Upper West Side Story, took this image and ran it through some kind of device he had, and he saw up here in the dark a roundish building. And he said, 8th Avenue, 32nd Street, Madison Square Garden. So this building is on the northwest corner of what, 8th Avenue and 30th, maybe 28th. So I hopped on the trusty number one downtown local again. <laughs> and I went to 28th Street and I walked down to 26th and I started walking between 5th and 9th Avenues. And I walked from, th from 26th Street all the way up to 40th Street and I didn't find this bloody building because it ain't in Manhattan. <laughs> it's in Brooklyn on, on Court Street and Livingston. And this building went up in 1927 and I have a note here to tell me who the architect was because I never remember and I think he only did one major building. Does anybody know? Is it Harvey Wiley Corbett? Beg pardon? It's not Harvey Wiley Corbett. No, it? no. This is Abraham J. Simberg 
And I'll bet, have you ever heard of him? No, if Carol hasn't heard of him, he did, did, didn't exist. He did only one building, as far, a major building as far as I know. This was the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. And in the 1920s, the Brooklyn, Brooklyn well, we, we forget Brooklyn was the third largest manufacturing city <coughs> in the country. And the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce was flexing its muscles and they put up this building. And oh, does, does anybody remember the education of Hyman Kaplan by Leo Rostin? Mm -hmm. he, was a, he was a Jewish immigrant in the Lower East Side. He took English as a second language. And he was asked by his teacher to give the principal parts of the verb to break. So Hyman Kaplan stood up and proudly said, break, broke, bankrupt. <laughs> that's, that's what happened to the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> and it is now, and these, uh, the, the, the window shade should have given it away, right? It is now a residence. It's been metamorphosed into an apartment house. Now, this is another one that stumped me. Oh, I know this one. <laughs> it's a I, in cancer. That's it. I looked at it and I pulled a total blank. It's Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. But I thought this steeple was a dead giveaway. So I went in search of that steeple. And on 60 what street? It must be 67th. Yeah, 67th is this building, which is the Holy Name Society. And it was designed by an architect named Wilfred E. Anthony. And it's a, a part of St. Vincent Ferrer, that great church on Lexington Avenue. Well, I wasn't far off. Uh, this is. Uh, this building was designed by, uh, by Wilfred Anthony. It is Saint, uh, so Saint who? Saint Catherine of Siena. It's on 68th Street between First and York. But all of my sleuthing didn't do any good because it didn't put me on 68th and York. But I remembered how Jan works. I'll be up in the helicopter with him and he'll say, oh, I'll be pointing out what I think is an important thing for him to shoot and he'll dismiss what I'm interested in and say, oh, John, that's very interesting, but tell me, what, what is that down there? So I looked at this photograph and somewhere in here in a better iteration is the Sl new Sloan Kettering building and that's what tipped me off as to where it was. This one stumped me. Uh, I sent out you know, what in dragnet parlance was an APB, an all points bulletin, and I got back, I mean, I showed this to all sorts of people, including a former police commissioner. He said, that ain't New York. Maybe, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's Brighton Beach. Maybe it's even Miami. Only one person was able to identify it, and that, that was, uh, an old classmate at Trinity School, and he, uh, he writes a, a piece for the web called City Review. His name is Carter Horsley, and Carter identified it. He said, that's Symphony House. And I said, of course it's Symphony House. Everybody knows it's Symphony House. I have it right here on Manhattan block by block, but I had never seen it from that perspective before. And I hadn't a clue what I was looking at. Not even those rounded balconies gave it away to me. I looked at this and I thought, oh my God, this, this could be the, the Upper West Side, the Upper East Side, it could be mile after mile of Brooklyn. It's Harlem. And what gave it away you know, the average row of houses is an unbroken row of houses. <clears throat> if you look up here, you'll see that there is a break in the houses mm -hmm. and another one there. And it's not that houses were torn down, it's that they were never built there in the first place. This is what we have come to call Strivers Row. 
It is officially called St. Nicholas Historic District and was put up in the 1890s by a builder named David King, a construction guy. He, he had done a few major undertakings, a few baubles, such as the base of the Statue of Liberty, Madison Square Garden, and he figured he was going to cash in and go and become a developer. So he hired three separate architects to design the, these rows of, of private homes. Uh, he asked Bruce Price, who designed 100 Broadway and uh, two, uh, Tuxedo Park. <coughs> Bruce Price had a daughter named Emily. <coughs> who did she marry? <coughs> Mr. Post. His daughter became Emily Post, the etiquette queen. He had McKim, Mead, and White design this row of buildings up here. And he had the architect of the appellate division, a lord, design the, the row down here. Now, flanking these rows of private homes on the avenues are apartment houses all designed by the same architects who designed the respective rows. Now, does anybody recognize this? It ain't St. Thomas. This is City College. George B. Post, who was a relative of the man that Emily Post married, by the way. Um, This is all terracotta. People look at it and think, my God, you know, the sculptor must have been up there for days, weeks, months, but it's all stamped out of a mold. And here you can see uh, one of those finials. This stone, by the way, is uh, Manhattan schist. Uh, remember when City College was being built between 1900 and 1904, what else was being built? The first successful subway. So August Belmont II, who was already as rich as Croesus, saved some more money because he didn't have to pay to schlep the stone. <laughs> City College bought it. And here's, uh, here's the, the, there are the finials, and there's one of the apartment houses for, from Strivers Road. City College overlooks it. Now, does anybody recognize this building? I'll tell you, my wife worked in this one right here. And she looked at this photograph and she looked out over this building. She didn't recognize it. If you lived in, in Cincinnati and this building were in Cincinnati, it would have been the second tallest building in Cincinnati from 1930 until only about yesterday. This building is only about five feet shorter than Carew Tower, the tallest building in Cincinnati. Does anybody here know the name of this building? Nelson Building? Yes. Go to the head of the class. Uh, a dead giveaway. Down here, you see these trailers? Those are for Boomerang Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. And this structure here is Madison Square, and this is Two Penn Plaza, and this black ghost-like thing is One Penn Plaza. And this was designed by this, the, the same guy who did 40 Wall Street, uh, the Bank of Manhattan building, H. Craig Severance. Now this is, this is the kind of photograph that Jan takes and he thinks nothing of it. You know, but to a New York crazy, you can spend a couple of hours looking at this photograph and become totally lost in it. Uh, you, you, you know, basically, the, the time of year that this was shot, because here it is, it's 4.15 according to the to MetLife clock. So you know that this is the dead of winter, right? If, this, if it were sunny today, I, I, I was stunned. I left the house at a few minutes after five. I'm on the Upper West Side, and it's still fairly bright out. So, you know, we, we're not gonna be sad much longer, right? So this is probably taken on uh, the winter solstice. But one of the things I want you to see especially is the dome of the New York Life Insurance Building, which does not have its usual gold on it, the gilt. Uh, and here it is with the gilt. Now the gilt simply comes off in the elements and it has to go somewhere, right? So it goes down to the pavements. 
which explains the belief that the pavements in New York are paved with gold. Uh, this was one of the last gasps of Cass Gilbert, uh, who designed uh, one of the baubles that is here, o over there somewhere, the Woolworth <laughs> building. Um, and uh, I love this reliquary up at the top. Um, this is a, this building stands on the site of the original Madison Square Garden. And this is Madison Square, which gave rise to the name Madison Square Garden. Now, I, I have to make a confession. Uh, as uh, much of a maniac as I might be, uh, and as punctilious as I might be in the book, I screwed up. Uh, I talked about Madison Square being part of the original city plan of 1811, the gridiron plan, and I, it was originally called the parade. And it would have stretched, it stretched on paper from 14th to 23rd streets, from 3rd to 7th avenues. And in the book, I say that it only stretched from 3rd to 5th, or would have. And what happened to it is that in the 1830s and 40s, the city, as usual, was suffering uh, economic and financial reverses. And the mayors, including Mayor Harper of Harper and Row, uh, decided to sell off the land. Made sense, right? The, the city would profit by the sale of the property, and then they could tax what, whatever was put up on the property. So the parade was reduced to going from the newly created Madison Avenue, which was an afterthought, it's not part of the original gridiron plan, to Fifth Avenue from 23rd to 26th, and that's it. Now, here is the, the gridiron plan, and here's the parade, and if you count the, this, the avenues, there's 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th. So, and what don't you see? You don't see uh, Broadway north of 23rd, do you? It disappears. Nor do you see Madison, uh, nor do you see Central Park. Uh, the city planners who gave us the gridiron plan said that the waterfront would be good enough to frolic in. Well, they, they knew better, actually, because why are there so many crosstown streets vis-a-vis -vis North South Avenues? There's a cr crosstown street every 200 feet. North South Avenues range from 600 plus to 900 plus between them. Uh, because the city planners knew that the waterways, remember this is 1811, and the primary form of long distance transportation was by water. So the ships that tied up along the East River would have been usually transatlantic or at least intercoastal and water uh, ships that tied up along the Hudson were probably coming down from upstate and the Erie Canal, etc. Now, what are we looking at? Is this the Adirondacks? This is Central Park. Central Park, yeah. This is the rowboat lake. This is where you rent the rowboats. This is Bethesda Fountain. There's Bow Bridge. And this is the Ramble. This is a, a, you can, you can, I mean, even people who know New York City cold can get lost in the ramble. Uh, but this is the ideal of Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Fox. Uh, Olmsted was a writer. Uh, he, he wrote on slavery in the South, for instance. And in 1858, he teamed up with Calvert Fox, who was an English-trained architect, and they came up with a plan for a central park. It wasn't central to the population, it was central to the island. And it originally was to have gone from 59th to 106th, but they extended it by a few blocks and more. And this is what we get. It's the romantic ideal. Um, uh, Olmsted thought that people should be able to get away from the hurly-burly nature of the city and find some tranquility. Uh, he, knew, he knew that the wealthy uh, were uh, going by ferry and a horse car, etc., to Greenwood Cemetery to go on, sat on Sunday afternoon picnics. Uh, the poor couldn't afford to do that, and they needed a real park, so Olmsted gave this. Now, this is a this is a view of Bow Bridge, which goes across the rowboat lake. And if you look at this bunch of besuited men, 
there's a camera, there's a photographer there with a tripod. Mm -hmm. And I assume that one of those men is, is the groom because look who's over here, <laughs> the bride. And I've been told that, that the, the Bow Bridge is a favorite uh, uh, venue for weddings, uh, not necessarily for performing them, but for having the photographs taken there. And this, uh, this is called the Belvedere, and it provides a beautiful view of itself and a beautiful view from it. And it's on just north of, uh, I guess, 81st Street. Uh, it was designed by Calvert Vox just to, just to be a, 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 a folly, didn't serve any function. And it was, made to, it was made at a diminutive scale because Vox wanted people to look at it from, well, the rowboat lake, for instance, and think that it was miles and miles away. It was pure illusion and it worked. As a kid, I always, you know, I'd sit down here and think about the damsel in distress up here, and whether I go and save her. Uh, Calvert Vox also did this building, which is the Jefferson Market Courthouse, and this this was uh, voted one of the ten most beautiful buildings in the United States in the 1870s. Um, we would uh, we would probably have lost this building if it hadn't been for the Iron Lady Margot Gale who uh, popularized the art uh, the uh, cast iron construction, and she saw that this uh, clock was restored to working order, and now it's the whole thing was uh, was originally a, a this is the second iteration on on this on the uh, spot. This is Sixth Avenue, and this is Tenth Street angling. <coughs> down. Um, this was a fire watch tower. It wasn't just a tower, it served a function. And uh, it is the second one on the site. And this looks like a Tuscan hill town, doesn't it? Uh, but it ain't. Uh, this is Morningside Heights. This is Columbia. This is Low Library. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Itali Casa Italiana which was designed by the uh, vestigial firm of McKim, Mead and & White. And McKim, Mead & White were responsible for the layout and design in general of Columbia. But McKim did this building himself. He farmed out a lot of other work, uh, in part because Seth Lowe, who was the president of Columbia, believed that if every building looked like every other building, it would be difficult to get money to donate um, people to donate money because they don't want to to give put, to put their name on a building that looks like everybody else's. So let individual architects with, within a with, with, within a certain standard design buildings. Uh, this building uh, is one of the more idiosyncratic buildings. Uh, this is St. Paul's Chapel, not to be to, not to be confused with the one on Fulton and Broadway, and uh, it is it's basically inter or non-denominational. Um, and it was designed by uh, an architect whose name you might know, uh, I.N. Phelps Stokes. The I.N. stands for Isaac Newton. And Stokes is most famous for having written the six volume iconography of Manhattan Island. And as far as urban historians are concerned, if you have, well, I say that I say that the iconography is the Bible, and everything else is apocrypha, uh, and it's uh, it is the, the work. Carol is nodding her head. The work that you must have. Um, Stokes, uh, do, do you know the, uh, the the Stokes family uh, were, were, were not uh, impoverished? Uh, they uh, they uh, built uh, three brownstone freestanding mansions on the east side of Madison Avenue between 36th and 37th. One of them still stands, and it's now an annex to the Morgan Library, and that's where Ian Phelps Stokes grew up. And he married in 1895 uh, this woman, and this portrait was a wedding gift to them. And Mrs. this was painted about 1898 by John Singer Sargent. And originally, there was to be a dog over here. 
but the dog, got, I don't know, got sick or something. So Ian Phelps Stokes said, you know, well, maybe I'll stand in for the dog. So here he is in the shadows. Now this, uh, this, this, pardon me? That's right, it's the old police headquarters. If you were to pick this building up and put it on the bank of the Liffey in Dublin, you would think that you were looking at the custom house. Uh, they're, they're virtually interchangeable. Uh, this building uh, had a shooting range in the basement. Uh, the, the, the commissioner's uh, office was oak, I guess it was oak paneled, I'm not sure. But it was wood paneled. Uh, everything was, was plush and lush, much like the, uh, the commissioner's office in the custom house was. And it is now an apartment house. And I'm, I'm told that some of the apartments in it are fantastic. Uh, this is the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. Uh, there was a great discussion about where the, uh, first off, where the monument should be. And the first, uh, there, there was a competition held, and it was won by the architects Stoughton and Stoughton. And the monument was to be, was to have been, I have to get my tense right, on Fifth Avenue uh, between 59th and 60th. Well, you know it ain't there, that's where the Sherman statue is. And when the discussion was going on, people were saying, well, Frederick Law Olmsted specified that he didn't want grand sculpture or, or entrances to the park. He wanted it to be natural. He didn't want the hand of man to be noticed in the park. So it was determined that the winning plan would be somewhere else. And the idea, well, this is a soldiers and sailors monument, so naval officers said, this should be overlooking the Hudson. So they said, let's put it at 72nd and Riverside Drive. Well, it wound up at 89th and Riverside Drive because that allowed the aging Civil War veterans to march from the memorial to Grant's tomb. <laughs> Made sense, right? However, what we're looking at is modeled on the uh, monument of uh, the Ly of Lysocrates, the Karagic monument. This was not what Stoughton and Stoughton had proposed, nor is the design that had been awarded first prize. They said, well, tough, you know, you, we, we don't like what we did for 59th Street. This is better. And you know what the city did? They backed down. They said, okay, we'll do it. Now, uh, there are lots of other, uh, well, I, I should talk about Karajic monuments. We all know about the Olympics, right? Every four years, a bunch of athletes run around and get gold medals. Well, in ancient Greece, every four years, choruses held competitions. And instead of being given gold medals, they had a monument put up in their honor. And the most famous was the Karajic monument, Karajic, C-H-O-R, same root as Chorus, right? Uh, the Karajic Monument of Lysocrates uh, is the most famous, and you'll find lots of them in New York, including this one atop the municipal building. Um, excuse me. Um, the municipal building was designed by <clears throat> The, again, the vestigial firm of McKimmead and White, both McKim and White were dead by the time it went up. Uh, and it is taught by this uh, Karajic monument. And the statue of civic virtue atop it by Adolf Weinman, who, uh, who had gone to Cooper Union. And I think this photograph finds the perfect foil in the banal uh, Javits building. Um, couldn't, it couldn't be better. But it's not the only Karajic monument atop a building. Now we're not looking at the frozen Hudson or East River. This is the Robo Lake in Central Park we're looking at. And this is the, this is the top of the San Remo Apartments between 74th and 75th. And the glory of the San Remo Apartments is there isn't just one Karajic monument, there are two. And this is designed by Emery Roth 
who uh, in the 20s and 30s was in his heyday and one of the most successful architects around and one of the most iconoclastic. He, I mean, he would borrow from one period and say, well, you know, I'll use that and borrow from another period and make a pastiche. Now, this has basically every neoclassical element known to man on it, every neoclassical tchotchke. <laughs> and this is, uh, you expect to see uh, Raymond Massey standing on top of these buildings, right, with wind blowing through his hair. Uh, this is a view of the majestic apartments from the northwest, and you don't frequently think of majestic apartments from that angle. You usually see them from Central Park West, and you don't see these great arcing uh, angles. And when you look at the Chrysler building, just imagine this going up the side of the, you know, tilted 90 degrees and going up the side of the building. We've got the Chrysler building, right? Uh, these were designed by Erwin Channon, who did the Channon building, and another architect named Jacques, I want to say... Delamar, isn't it? Delamar, right, with a double R. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> now, these two buildings are 770 and 770, 78 Park Avenue. And they were, they were, they were between 70, uh, this is 74th, I guess. They face each other. Uh, these were designed by Rosario Candela, who designed, very, they went up at the same time as the Majestic and the San Remo, for instance, but you wouldn't know it to look at them uh, because these were designed for I guess it's safe to say the one percent. Uh, and the one percent like uh, don't necessarily like things that are on cutting edge. Uh, they prefer things that are far more conservative. And when you when you when you th when you think about the the prices today, I, I I mean there was a story in the paper the other day about the six thousand square foot penthouse apartment at 15th Central Park West going for $88 million. I heard that the new 90-story building going up on 57th Street is asking $100 million for an apartment because they want to be able to say that they had the most expensive apartment in the city. But what, there, there's an apartment in one of these, I think it was 770, that was on the market. And it was, it was a paltry $10 million, which is small potatoes in today's scheme of things, right? However, the annual maintenance <laughs> comes to more money than a sitting judge on the Supreme Court of State of New York takes home in a year. So when you talk about the, about the 1% and the 99 percenters, this is clearly the 1% here. Now, uh, here we have Two of the great skyscrapers of lower Manhattan. Uh, this is 40 Wall Street, which was originally the bank of the Manhattan Company. Remember, it was started by Aaron Burr as a water delivery system, and he had a little codicil in the uh, state agreement that allowed him to start a bank. So the bank of the Manhattan Company became none other than Chase Manhattan, ultimately. Uh, this is now called the Trump Building, modestly. Uh, 40 wall, and uh, this is one, one of the great Art Deco buildings in Lower Manhattan. This was originally the city service building, which uh, is today Sitco, uh, but it was its last inhabitant was... Um, AIG. Yeah, what's the full name? Um, American Insurance Group. Um, yeah, AIG, American Insurance Group. And you know what's happened to them. And the building is now empty. Um, uh, this, it's purchased. Oh, it has been. Yeah, yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, good. Berman is going to convert it to apartments. Well, you know, this building originally had two uh, double-decker elevators. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, they discovered that, that, that people felt very discomforted in them and they made them single. Uh, so the, the man who uh, headed city service, I believe, had an apartment in this building, so it's going back to a, an original function, as it were. Um, and here it is again from another perspective. This is uh, the, we're, we're southeast of it here 
and this building is the Woolworth building. Uh, Frank W. Woolworth, uh, after he had finally acquired the frontage on Broadway at Park Place, uh, was talking with his architect, Cass Gilbert, and Gilbert said, well, you know, well, tell me really, you know, and I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but who would never let a bad fact get in the way of a good story. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what do you want the building to look like? And uh, Woolworth said, I don't care what it looks like as long as it looks like the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> and how tall do you want it? I don't care how tall it is as long as it's tall, the Metropolitan Life Tower, which was then the world's tallest building. So we got uh, the Woolworth building. And this view shows docks going up Hudson River, which are now basically defunct as docks. Uh, how the infrastructure of the city has changed in the past 50 years is absolutely remarkable. And this, uh, this view uh, knocks my socks off every time I see it. Uh, this, of course, is what you and I probably still call the Queensboro or the 59th Street Bridge. Officially, this is the Mayor Koch Bridge, Edward I. Koch Bridge. Uh, this is uh, what I still call Welfare Island, but uh, it was originally Blackwells, etc. Uh, and it's now Roosevelt, and this is the tennis courts there. This is River House, uh, which, is, which uh, originally had a private dock at the foot of the East River before the East River Drive was put in. And floating by is the spire of the Chrysler Building. Um, Jan just snapped it. I mean, it's, uh, it's unbelievable to me. And here is the Chrysler Building. And remember, I, I pointed out those diminishing arcs on the, on the majestic apartments. Uh, you can see them here. And here is the Chrysler Building at night. Now, the Chrysler Building originally did not have those windows lit. They had installed the um, the what? I don't know, the structure. So what, what do you call, where you put a light bulb? <laughs> a fixture, a fixture, a socket. Uh, but they had never installed the lights themselves. And then the building went and got itself designated as a New York City landmark, and so the, the building couldn't unilaterally or cavalierly change anything about its facade. So they went down to the Landmark Preservation Commission with the plans showing that the, the building was originally intended to be lit. And Elliot Wolanski told, uh, Elliot Wolanski, who was then a, the first vice chairman of the Landmark Preservation Commission and the co-author of the AIA guide, told me that as far as he knows, it was the fastest meeting of the Landmark Preservation Commission on record. <laughs> Apparently, the Chrysler Building people walked in, they said, this is what we want to do, and without a single nay, without a single hesitation, do it, they said. I wanted to confirm the story, so I called the, the Public Affairs Department at the Landmark Preservation Commission, and guess what they cannot find? Any record of any discussion on allowing this to happen. So don't tell the Landmark Preservation Commission. That's all I can say. Now, you know the distinctive spire atop the Chrysler Building. Uh, you know, it got put there because the, the, William Van Allen, who had been the former partner with uh, uh, the guy who put up 40 Wall Street, uh, were in a race with each other. And Chrysler announced uh, falsely that they were calling it quits. So the Bank of Manhattan put on the top of its building. And what do you think Chrysler did? went, yeah, 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 we're going to keep right on going. So they went to 1,046 feet. At the same time that the Chrysler was, had done that, the Empire State Building was going up. And John J. Raskob was the money man at the Empire State Building. And he had been the chief financial officer of General Motors. Was he going to let that upstart, that pipsqueak Walter Chrysler, best him at building the world's tallest building? Not on your life. Raskob said, we will not stop at 1,000 feet. We'll make a five-story penthouse. We'll make the building 1,048 feet high. And we'll best Chrysler by two feet. Then they said, well, you know, nobody will remember 1,048 feet, so we'll make it 1,050 feet. 
And so the height of the Chrysler building, because everybody said the Empire State Building at 1,050 was two feet taller than the Chrysler, so the Chrysler building gained two feet. You know, you subtract two from 1,050, and what do you get? 1,048. Then the, somebody said, look, you know, if we d have done to Chrysler, look what we've done to Chrysler. Somebody can come along and do to us. So they added a, a dirigible mooring mass, the looniest building scheme since the Tower of Babel. Anyway, Chrysler was originally to have a dome, to have had a dome, not unlike this one. Do you know this dome? Ringsburg Savings Bank. Ringsburg Savings Bank, yep, in Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn. And it's sort of a Romanesque Byzantine pastiche. And uh, this was the, word, the uh, tallest building in Brooklyn. Uh, and when you look at this clock, you wonder about the description of Romanesque Byzantine, don't you? This is pretty art deco. Uh, and it's a great, these two photographs are not in the book. But this one is, and uh, like Carol, I've seen thousands of photographs of the Empire State Building, but no two like the two that are in the book. Um, this photograph shows the wings at the base of the dirigible mooring mast, a perfectly appropriate symbol. This was the age of flight, after all. And this photograph uh, uh, looks like a... Uh, a lighthouse with a solitary lighthouse keeper up there. Uh, this, you know, the, the goal of the dirigible mooring mast was to have a dirigible, a lighter than aircraft, drop a line, it would be pulled in, winched down, and passengers would walk a gangplank <laughs> 1,250 feet in the air, perfectly happily. And they'd be deposited on this uh, space right there, which, which has a, a low wall, it's about that high. And uh, this, was, this was convenient for King Kong, because this is where he deposited Fay Ray. Um, but it was a crazy, crazy idea. Uh, but anyway, these are two fabulous photographs. Uh, and this is, this is another one of the great periods, the buildings from that same period of the late 20s, early 30s. Uh, this building now is, has the bland name of 570 Tower. It is 570 Lexington Avenue. And uh, when it was built, uh, it's, on the, it's on the southwest corner of 51st and Lexington. And when it was built, it was built for the RCA Company which explains all the bolts of electricity, et cetera, on it, and the, you know, the, these rays emanating from the, uh, the heads, et cetera. And what do you think RCA did uh, the moment the 30 Rockefeller Plaza opened? They moved out of this building over to Rockefeller Center. And who moved into this building? GE. GE, precisely. And now the building that I still call the RCA building is now called the GE building, right? So it's come full circle. Uh, but this, this building, it was a cross and cross, am I right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was cross and cross. And we were a fairly conservative architect, so they, you know, they designed the Barclay Hotel, they designed the Lynx Club on 62nd, is it? Uh, but the, the, this was a breakaway building, and it glows. Uh, in the, in the early 1950s, uh, the, they used to have lights emanating from within the building at Christmas. They'd have green and red going on and off, etc. But they, they haven't done that in years. This building, by the way, is the Waldorf Astoria. And here's the, one of the great Art Deco towers. Uh, this is Schultz and Weaver. And uh, uh, you, you don't think of the Waldorf Astoria as having towers like that, um, but it does. And this is a build. This is a photo that did not make the the cut. Uh, there's another one of this building. This is the New York Central Building, and uh, there, there, there was a radio host on W something in the early '60s named DeCoven. And it turns out he's no relation to Reginald de Coven, the composer. But the, the, the radio host uh, loved Baroque and Barococo music, and he coined a phrase, and he called his favorite music Barococo. 
And if you use the word Baracoco to describe this lantern, I think you'll have done it justice. Uh, this building served as the capstone for Park Avenue when you looked south from 96. This was the New York Central building. And along came the Pan Am building, the dreaded Pan Am building to rise, loom behind it to destroy the scale of Park Avenue. And this building now sits in its shadow, which, uh, you know, the, I think the irony of the Pan Am building is that soon after it went up, there was a cartoon showing people in modern and futuristic dress protesting, saying, save the Pan Am building. Uh, tear, it, tear it bloody down, be done with it. Uh, this, this is 77 Water Street, and this is one of those in architectural jokes. Uh, this, apart, this office building was built by Melvin Kaufman, who was a classic bottom liner uh, developer, only he had, a whim, he had a whimsical side to himself. And on, uh, on the rooftop of 77 Wall Street, he put the 77th Aerodrome, complete with, with a, a, a mock, I think it's a Sopwith Camel, uh, and a runway. Uh, this is all, uh, this is designed by Rudolf de Harrick, who was a great graphic designer. And it's only seen uh, by people in offices uh, above it and by the passing helicopter passenger and photographer. And this, by the way, was uh, precinct number one for the police department. It's now the, the uh, police museum. <coughs> Does anybody recognize this? This is Salon de Ning atop the Peninsula Hotel on 55th, on the southwest corner of 55th and 5th. This is the St. Regis Hotel over here. Over here is Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. When this hotel went up in, <clears throat> I forget, this was about 1902 or four, <clears throat> it was called the Gotham. And uh, we remember, uh, more fools pass through Gotham than stay. That that was what uh, was said in the Knickerbocker history. Well, the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church uh, had the right to say to developers, "You may not serve alcohol on your premises if it is if the front door is within 200 feet of the front door of the church." So, uh, who do you think was building uh, St. Regis, the uh, patron saint of welcome? Uh, none other than John Jacob Astor, the, what, fourth, the colonel, John Jacob Astor, who went down on the Titanic. He changed his plans and moved the front entrance to the St. Regis to the side street to 55th Street, 200 plus feet away from the entrance to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. The Gotham was stuck, however. They couldn't do it, so they were bone dry. And you know that the, the, the revenues of many hotels are dependent on the revenues from, from restaurants, and the revenues from restaurants are dependent on the sale of booze. Uh, it's one reason that the Waldorf Astoria was in financial straits in the mid-1920s because they were not about to be a, a speakeasy. They weren't going to sell booze illicitly or illegally and they basically were on the verge of bankruptcy. Well, the Gotham uh, s established a group of what were described as cherubic young boys who had wicker hampers, who would go, over to, go down to 6th Avenue, stock up on booze, go back to the hotel and sell it, sub to the to the people. Uh, but the hotel went bankrupt. And it's had a whole string of different owners. This is Salon de Ning now operating on the rooftop. And again, uh, you know, you talk about the one percenters. Uh, a cocktail at Salon de Ning <laughs> costs $23. So these five guys here are spending 115 bucks before tax and tip around if they're drinking cocktails. <laughs> Uh, here's, a, here's another uh, outdoor dining space. Uh, this is 235th, and this is probably the largest outdoor uh, rooftop dining restaurant in the city. And um, this is, uh, this is a, a, a basically an office slash loft building, and this is a terrific uh, use for the rooftop, and it is. They do, they do have a, uh, a, 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 a what, a, um, 
standard for dress, a dress code. Uh, no torn dungarees. I think, you know, I think that's fair enough, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, that's all right. Now this is a view, this is a view of my RCA building, uh, the, AKA the GE building, 30 Rock. And this photograph did not make the cut. Mm -hmm. And you, will un you understand why. It's not perfectly framed. You know, in order for Jan to want a photograph of the top of a building, this would have to be at 90 degrees. That'd have to be perfectly. But look at these spandrels. I mean, I think you can call these spandrels. A spandrel is, is the object that spans the top of one window with the bottom of the window above. And it's an easy mnemonic because it spans the distance. You know, it's like dentals. They look just like teeth. Um, but it, the, Jan didn't want this photograph. Um, <clears throat> I love it. I was up there in the helicopter when he took this photograph. He took a whole bunch more at the same time. And the pilot is in regular uh, radio contact with the controller at LaGuardia. And the, the controller at LaGuardia said that the uh, security people at the, at the GE building had alerted the controller at LaGuardia that there was a helicopter that was flying too, too close to the building and they were worried. So we were, we were waved off and we, we had to leave the premises. Now this is uh, Palazzo Chupi uh, down on West 11th Street. Uh, Julian Schnabel, the artist and filmmaker, designed it. He built it atop a four-story, what is described as stable, but it really, uh, it was built in 1911 and it was built for deliveries, so it was no doubt uh, what you and I would call a uh, garage rather than a stable. Uh, but uh, this is one of the most extravagant new buildings to go up. And I, I love it. If I had 10 million bucks, I'd buy an apartment in the, in the Twix. Um, the Greenwich Village Preservation Society hated it. Uh, they ranted and raved. They screamed, it's pink, it's pink. It's too big, it's too big. Uh, and it's not that much bigger than the neighboring, you know. I mean, how much bigger is Palazzo Chupi than the building next door? Not much. The other great new building is the IAC building by Gary um, on 12th Avenue and 24th Street. Uh, this is called, uh, this is, what, what is it called? It's called the, the waves or something, right? Billowing, the clouds, the sails, sails, yeah, it's called the sails. And this is, uh, this is a photograph that Jan took. It. He, he likes to shoot very early in the morning or very late in the afternoon. And I love this photograph because of the Empire State Building up here, which is glowing red. And when, when, when they were putting up the building, uh, people who were, who were taking ferries to New Jersey at the end of business day were remarking as the stainless steel spandrels were going up the side of the building, they, they were remarking about how the spandrels reflected the setting sun. And here you see it. And I don't know what the time is. There's, I went over. <laughs> so uh, if, there, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. Uh, um, thank you. I, I, I do have one request of our host, and that is that she put aside a glass of red wine for me. <laughs> I'm going to stand up and pour some wine, but maybe we can take a couple of questions while yeah, we get sure. the, um, the refreshments in order. Um, yeah, we assume that the reason he likes to photograph early in the morning, and particularly late at night, is the contrast. You could pick out an object and it would be kind of black behind it. Yeah, and, all, and also the, 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 the light falls flat on the building. Yeah, 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 and, there, and the shadows are diminished. If he's shooting from with, when the sun is high, the building itself creates its own shadows, and he, he doesn't like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 
I, I had a, a thought. I'm, I'm a proud owner of your book. <coughs> and I find I keep going back to it and back to it and back to it. And it occurred to me what, what's going on in my head is we're getting a deeper uh, sense of preservation from above. And indeed, there's phraseology that says there's the upper west side, you know, the Central Park West skyline. There's the Navarro Brooklyn skyline. And I think your book adds yet another dimension, which is appreciating things from above. And indeed, you're showing that very, you know, graphically and visually. Well, oh, thank you. Uh, this is my resident shield. I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, th 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 thank you. Uh, the uh, you know when you, when you think of, of architecture, uh, the. The normal skyscraper has a beginning, middle, and end. Horizontal, vertical, horizontal. And the architects don't put a lot of detail in the, the, the column-like aspect of the building. They put it at the base and they put it at the top. And the average person walking down the street, even if the average person looks at the decoration at the bottom part, uh, it's a rarity. Hardly anybody ever looks up. Uh, uh, and and you, I mean, you, you miss it, you know, even if you are looking for it, you, you, you miss it. Yes? Do many of the towers that you showed us hold water tanks? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, m many of them in, in are, are cleverly disguised. Uh, there's a, one of my favorite buildings is on 57th Street, uh, just west of uh, 9 West. Uh, it was put up by the Chickering Piano Company, and they 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 have a tower atop it, and there, there's a legion of, of merit, I guess it is, a, an award that is stuck on there because they beat uh, Steinway at the, in the contest, so they wanted to rub Steinway's nose in it. But that's masking a water tower and elevator housing. <coughs> yes. I, I hope you didn't cover this, but uh, I remember in your first edition, there was a gorgeous green cornice. And it's between that edition and this edition, it's stupidly been painted beige. Do you, do you remember the green cornice in your old book? No. It's on 7th Avenue and about 24th Street. Anyway, I just wondered if you had, if, if there were any other stupid changes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real color. Uh, <laughs> uh, you mean the original one? I, I, well, I mean, you know, for years I saw it as I would see it as green. It was in John's book. The original book is green. And then the co op board painted the corners beige. So Bad. So you can copy the book there. Oh, no. <laughs> No, I mean, this is a lot. Yes. Thank you, first of all, for such a great tour. Thank you. What, are there any new towers or new crowns that you find personally that you'd like to get back up in a helicopter and shoot or bring you back to town? You, you, you see the Mecca building over there? Uh -huh. that's, that's the building I want to shoot. <laughs> uh, quite frankly, yeah, I know it's a tough question. Yeah, well, no, it's an easy one to answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Contemporary buildings don't add anything to their roof lines. So they're, you know, they're boring. They're, they're boring. So the Bank of America are interesting. Well, the Bank of America is a fraud. <laughs> you know, they claim that they are uh, <laughs> as high as the Chrysler Building, but what what they add is that that puny tower. We're, and you know the definition of architecture is something that houses something, and they say that that's architectural. Well, the only thing it houses is a bunch of pigeons, you know, and and, that, and that's it. They claim to be taller than the place, so they claim to be the second tallest building. Yeah, yeah. The second tallest spire. Yeah, the second tallest spire. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I just wanted to comment. Uh, on Sunday, I walk the Brooklyn Bridge as I often do, and uh, there's a changing skyline that you see now when you're coming from Brooklyn. Uh, oh, 
I mean, I, I mean, I think the Gary Building, uh, Spruce Street, is, is is fabulous, but it has a boring roof line. It's the sides. Uh, are the sides are terrific, but the but the roof line is is boring. Uh, I, I I rode the. Uh, I was down here in this neck of the woods a couple of days ago, and I live on the Upper West Side, and since I design maps, I know that the number five bus operates from down here all the way up to there. So I took it, and it only took me an hour and a quarter to get home, but on the way, I noticed the roof line on the McAlpin Hotel, which I hadn't looked at for years, and it is fabulous. It's, 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 it's mind-boggling. Uh, and when you compare that with what's across, you know, you know what, what's basically up the block from it, you know, what, two Penn Plaza, you know, are you going to look at that, that a second time? Or one Penn Plaza? Uh, no, you're not. That's a down note, I know. I don't want to end on it. What's, <laughs> what's, what's an up note? <laughs> So I think we have the wine poured out, and I should mention that we have only six books available tonight, so if you do want us an autograph book, you'll have to come up here and grab it quickly, um, but uh, there'll be more when they arrive uh, later later this week from the book, unfortunately, but anyway, thank you for coming tonight. Sure.